record on this computer. Okay, so hopefully there's a red light, there's a recording. We go. Okay, so uh, just for the uh, for those people joining by video, <laughs> I've just done some eight basic introductions in the room. Uh, we we sort of scheduled um, uh, you know a good three hours for this discussion, but really. You know, it, it's only going to last three hours if there's lots of questions from you guys and, and lots of participation, I think, you know. So um, uh, I think the, the soonest, the, the best thing I can do is actually now hand over the, uh, the, the, the chat room, the, the Zoom room, to Zoom land to, uh, to Dave of Share Energy. Shave, Dave, do you want me to present the, your uh, presentation or do you want to try no, and do no. it? Um, no, Nick, it's easier if I do it than I can. Uh, otherwise, I've okay. got to call out next slide all the time. Hey, you have indeed. So yes. if you would like to take it away, Dave. Right. Good morning, all. Can you see the first slide? We can. Thank yeah. you. Great. OK, um, so um, there are uh, I've divided the presentation into sections. So the idea is that we can um, uh, look at other opportunities first and then discuss those then we'll look at rooftop solar and discuss those uh, and then we can think about next steps and organizational governance matters um, at the end so um there is also a chat function so if you yes. if you have a thought <laughs> and you want to get it into the chat function uh, that's fine rather than waiting till uh ask, asking questions so um, the first thing we did was, um, and of course it hasn't changed slide wise that, here we go. So the first thing we did was look at the capacity available in the local network in the three towns that we're looking at. So this is the Booth Wells um, primary substation, which covers Clanoted Wells, and we can see lots of red dots here. So upstream generation headroom minus 6.25 MVA. So at the moment, and bear in mind this is this is this is um, this is a guide. These these capacity maps are a guide. They're not necessarily up to date. They they will often include schemes that have booked a connection. So if you were building a solar farm, you you would book a connection in advance. Now, if that solar farm doesn't get built, then that connection capacity might suddenly become available later in the day. But at the moment, um, it doesn't look like there's really much room for, um, um, there's, there's demand room. You could, you could set up a factory and get a connection and, and draw electricity from the grid, but there isn't the upstream generation headroom for you to be able to export any significant amount of power. Um, we also looked at Prestine. Well, that's minus 50. <laughs> yes. So, um, so that's not looking very good either. Um, and we looked at Clanvuckin. The reason Clanvuckin is different is because you're in the S Pen uh, area rather than um, in the WPD area. For some reason, the line cuts across Paris. I think it's the old ManWeb. Part of it was ManWeb and part of it was something else. Yes, Nick, you've got a question? Yeah, I, just the minus numbers, Dave. I mean, how is that possible? Does that does that actually mean that there is no capacity to export anything? Or what, what's the techni yes. technical that's technical? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, um, I'm not sure I understand it myself, but it means... <laughs> It means basically, presumably there is some flexibility in the grid. Um, so they're saying they're already they're already over committed. And is that partly because I, I seem to remember a, an old story um, related to Western Power some years ago, whereby there was a small 16 kilowatt hydro scheme that needed to be added to the grid. And it sort of triggered a, a requirement to to upgrade the, the whole grid. And they were actually quoted a charge of, of you know, two million quid or to, to install yes. that connection. Is that because a lot of it is just booked, potentially booked in advance in terms of the requirement? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some of that will be booking in advance. But yes, um, I'm not an electrical engineer, um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, it's definitely in the red. It's definitely already over over committed. So, uh, um, I mean, obviously, there's some flexibility there because what they what they allow for is everybody to be exporting at the same time. 
-hmm. And that, of course, is very rarely going to happen. So they can go into the red a certain certain degree, um, and then um, they would basically refuse. Uh, you know, if a solar farm wants to export, they've got the ability to say no, thanks, we don't we don't want your electricity today because everyone else is exporting yeah. at the same time. But when you've got a mix of renewables, um, it's very unlikely that your wind and your solar and your hydro are all going to be generating to their maximum capacity at the same time so that's that's how it can go into the into the red uh thanks dave uh just to uh, test your uh, you know you're not an electrician there's two sort of technical <laughs> questions that have popped into the chat immediately um and that is i don't know if we've actually explained the headroom uh alison asked can you explain different terms headroom etc and duncan is talking about um, what is mva is it the same as megawatts that that type of stuff you know it's it basically it's uh it's 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 measuring it's measuring the ampage but you can you can transfer that almost directly into megawatts yes yeah. and the headroom is just you know how much how much room is there how much capacity yeah. is there it's not really yeah um so you know it's saying that there is room to connect another 1.9 megawatts for demand but there's not room to connect any more generation and bear in mind this is this is talking about export here this is about feeding into the grid yeah. so this would be you know if you were building a solar farm that was grid connected or a wind turbine that was grid connected or a hydro this is where you would you would bump into these um grid constraints and it's um you know it's it's a thing that's been known known for a number of years in mid wales uh, you know, they have built a lot of wind turbines up on the hills um, and um, they haven't built any more in the last 10 years or so, really, because of this constraint. So there is talk about building a completely new um, power line to take electricity out of mid Wales um, uh, into England, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but that seems to be a long way off. And of course, there's there's opposition to putting in a new line of pylons and it's expensive to bury all the cables underground. So uh, they um, are working on it. The, 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 uh, the district network operators, so that's Western Power for most of you and S Pen for um, Clan Buckley, they are, they are working on this. They realize that this is a, uh, a problem but they tend to have quite long timescales for for dealing with this. They don't seem to be in a huge hurry. Um, the other thing is that the we can mention briefly is that the funding arrangements have now changed. It used to be that if you just needed a local upgrade, um, say there was a problem just within Clanvuckling, it wasn't a problem out to the wider world, but a problem within Clanvuckling, you needed uh, a new cable, um, a new connection. It used to be that you had to pay for it, even if other people coming along later would also benefit. They've now changed the rules on that and you only pay a, a contribution now um, and uh, the DNO will, will cover the rest and then re recover that money um, from any other new suppliers coming onto the system, which sounds great, sounds great, but it it means that you're at their at their whim yes. you know officially they're they're, they're paying for it <laughs> but you've then got to get into their priority list yeah. um you know and um so it's not necessarily as as good news as as it might seem thanks dave oh, we've got two more questions uh yes. just on that that grid connection issue though um i sit on the community liaison group for the Garnvach uh, wind farm proposal, which is an EDF proposal, uh, again above the on the Landenham, Landenham Hill, so it's a larger scale sort of development of the Landenham Hills, yeah. uh, you know, and they're talking about a ten year development sort of um, potential for that, primarily, not not to get their turbines in the ground, but to to sort out the grid connection that actually would actually export that power. And there's others around Langerig, as we know, people in Clanidloes will know. There's a a couple of schemes, there's one in Langerig and there's one sort of scheduled for sort of Kevin Cork. So there's interest in, in onshore wind growing. 
yes. but but nothing in 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 terms of government support for onshore wind seemingly that that might change the situation in terms of um, you know the the infrastructure that's required to enable that wind shore, that onshore wind. Yes. And to yes. a certain extent, you know, the, the correlation there is that, you know, we might be tied into some of those developments, as it were, in terms of community energy projects, I suppose. You know? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think one of the issues is that the district network operators have been very reactive on this. Yeah. So they wait for somebody to say, we want to make a connection and then you get on their list and then it might take years to do it there they're starting to think about, you know, um, enabling low carbon or net zero. Yeah. So they're starting to think about what, what facilities are we gonna have to put in place to enable this to happen? But they're at the beginning of that conversation. Um, and, and perhaps this is relevant to, to Duncan's uh, additional question in the chat, which is what about local distribution grids rather than an export grid? Is, is that where perhaps those developers, those, those um, and network operators are thinking perhaps or well um i mean there's two ways around this one is that we we um we look at community energy which is connected to a building so that most of the energy uh will be consumed by that building um and then uh you know there's there's a smaller amount of export and that smaller amount of export is likely to be you know when it if it if it if it's connected, you've got PV connected to a building, it's connected behind the meter so that that energy will be used in the building if the building requires it. If the building doesn't require that energy, then it goes out through the meter into the local grid, if you like, and basically it will then go next door um, or, or further down the street. It's very unlikely to actually leave yeah. through a um, through a substation up to the next level. Um, so normally we can get away with that. It's still you still have to ask the DNO's permission for anything over four kilowatts. Um, and in certain areas, um, I, I think it's not such a problem in Mid Wales, but certainly we've been doing some work in Worcestershire where there are a lot of solar farms. And the DNO are starting now to say no to PV, uh, even on rooftops, uh, to factories, um, based on the fact that, you know, the factory isn't running on a Saturday and Sunday. So on those two days a week, it would be exporting. And they've got so much solar power already uh, that, they, that they really don't want it. Okay. That shouldn't be a problem in mid Wales, because if anything, we've got a lot of wind and not so much solar and therefore the you know that 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 balances out on the grid um better okay thanks for that um i, I don't know if this question is related um and it's from tim tim where in Nicholas. what is the difference between reverse power and generation that's a very good question and it's giving <laughs> us a, is there a <laughs> pass i'll get back to you on that one <laughs> okay I'm sure I should know the, the uh, yeah, because there is there is some reverse power there, but there's not the generation headroom. Okay, I've um, no idea. Okay, thanks. Well, we'll 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 park that one. Um, <laughs> Alison, Alison, can I bring you in on this? Um, as you, as you you're raising a point here in terms of Flan do you want to do you want to sort of address this point? Yes, we've we've um, made a number of attempts to to try and figure out how we can install on street car chargers um, for electric cars for passing uh, tourists but also residents um, we, we have a community owned car park council owned car park so perfect place to put it but it seems to be a grid black or red zone there um, so yeah could we generate solar power off some neighboring buildings um, and funnel it towards the community car chargers um, yes certainly um we've actually done a project in Worcestershire uh, and Herefordshire which we've just completed which is looking at doing that with sort of village halls and, and the like fitting PV panels battery systems and EV chargers um so I'd be happy to supply a copy of that report um it does need some grant funding to to make it stack up um but it's you know if if it's um if it's 
uh, yeah, helping to provide that that facility, uh, which otherwise is is grid constrained, then um, then uh, that that's worth looking at. Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Okay, so there are a couple of additional points in in the chat, Dave, regarding I suppose the the, the politics of, of of grid upgrade, uh, and, and perhaps we can return to those at, at, uh, you know as the meeting goes on, because I'm just yes. conscious that we probably need to get into the uh, uh, more into your presentation for a moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so then then what we did was we looked at um, various options. I'm going to come back to rooftop solar as a as a separate item. So. The first thing we were looking at was hydro, and this was particularly raised by um, the group in Clanoted Wells. Uh, there's quite a nice river. It's got quite a nice flow on it. There were two issues. One, there isn't really much of a drop. You know, it drops about 1%. Uh, there are no weirs. Um, and it's also, um, there is this uh, uh, Irvine, uh, special area of conservation project. So, with the hydro scheme, you 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 really need two things. You need flow, but you also need drop. Um, and uh, normally, that's that's either provided by a weir, um, or it's provided, which is called a low head scheme, or it's provided by somehow damming the river uh, at a higher altitude and then piping water down to a lower turbine. Um, and it, of course, if you're if you're doing a high head scheme like like that, damming it and then piping it down, you are removing water from the flow of the river, and um, that is very unlikely to be acceptable um, to 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 any uh, extent in in a river with um, that's a special area of of conservation because they want the flow maintained to uh, to um, benefit the wildlife basically and um pristine and clan buckling are in a very similar situation they're actually all very similar places in the valley with a with a river running through but um but no real drop no real we haven't um we haven't found any uh hydro possibilities we also had a quick look at wind um, these are the wind maps provided on a website called uh, Noble, N-O-A-B-L. Um, and these, you can do it at various heights. These are at 45 meter hub height. So this is a sizable wind turbine. And the wind speeds are a bit low, generally, close to where, um, um, where the uh, electricity might be used. So, you know, if you were going up on the hills, especially above uh, Clenerative Wells, then you get up to eight meters per second average wind speed, which is perfectly viable. But then you're quite a long way away from any direct user. And as we've said, uh, it's difficult to get a connection directly into the grid. Um, Clenerative Wells, there is the possibility this, this, uh, I don't know if you, can you see my cursor? Does that come up? Um, anyway, we've got this red dot is actually not Glenerted itself. That's up in the hills uh, above. That was the possible likely location. And that could feed down uh, potentially to the hotel um, that's now a manufacturing facility that we'll, we'll come back to because we're proposing rooftop solar for that. Uh, so that is a possibility, but, you know, um, getting permission for a wind turbine is, is really hard work. Um, particularly here, we're in a MOD low fly zone. Um, you know, uh, there aren't any other wind turbines uh, immediately um, in the location. So Whilst whilst wind might be a longer term possibility, um, we don't think it's something that is worth uh, too much energy at, at this stage. We would recommend going for something a bit simpler and easier. I know, um, um, is it uh, Ineteg? Um, Dan McCullen at Ineteg um, 
they've now got uh, two wind turbines, I think, but it took him something like 15 years to <laughs> get that get those through the whole the whole planning situation and actually getting them built. So uh, um, and I think they've they've got a very good they've got a very good site and benefited from the feeding tariff, which of course we don't have anymore. In a, in a previous life, um, Dave, I was um, working with Robert Owen Community Banking Fund on, on um, loan finance for the development costs of wind turbines. Yes. Uh, well, not just wind turbines, any community energy project, actually. Yes. Um, uh, and yeah, the wind side of things was, well, everything had its complications, as you can imagine. And, and hydro, I, I can remember having some interesting conversations with um, with uh, NRW, as they are now, uh, around briar yes. fights and what briar fights do on, on the uplands. And, you know, and the precautionary principle seems to apply on any sort of uh, water extraction type project. Yes. Uh, but then in terms of the wind, you know, we were working in an environment where the feed-in tariff was disappearing rapidly at that point. So, you know, there was an extra incentive to try and yes. put these projects through quickly. And they just do not go through quickly. There's so many different potential variables and pitfalls within wind farms, yes. wind turbine yeah. development that yes. you, know, you could, you, could um, you know, expend a lot of energy uh, and get nowhere at the end of the day quite easily. With wind, yeah. I think. yeah, yeah. And I, I also think, I think I said it back in August, August that you know I think community energy needs to fill the gaps that the market can't provide and the market is working on wind power in mid Wales mm -hmm. um you know so maybe that's that's something left left to the left to the big boys rather than um yeah yeah and on that point actually because that there is you know yeah as you say there are there are big boys in the market but they are now under Welsh government guidelines duty bound to offer the potential of shared ownership within their schemes yes. as well so you yes. know that is actually piggybacking on, on on the development if you like i mean none of that's easy because these are big schemes and and, and yes. the percentage of shared ownership you need to take on is is rather expensive as it were but but yes. possibly the whole development cost being wrapped up in that bundle rather than individual community organizations having to do that is, is possibly yes. the way to go you know yes and let 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 the big boys take the take the risk and the get it through to development stage and and all the rest of it. So, I mean, I'm not saying no completely no to wind, but you know, it would be a it would be a longer term. Um, and and we we are we are working on two wind projects in England, and um, so maybe I'll report back in a year's time that uh, you know uh, that's possible. But you know, they are they are very hard work. The other interesting project that was mentioned in uh, in Pristine was there is a new build housing site uh, at the old foundry right in the middle of the town. And is there any way that we could we could do a community energy scheme that was improving the standard of the new build housing? Um, it's a it's a it's a lovely idea. Um, I haven't come across anybody who's made something similar work elsewhere in the UK. Um, it's difficult to imagine how the finances would work. There are, there are things called ESCOs, energy saving uh, companies, that, that, but mostly working in the retrofit area. And with retrofit, you can say, you know, this is your energy use now. We can we can pay to install this bit of kit or you know do insulation or whatever. Your your you should therefore make these savings and um, and um, then you can repay us out of your savings basically. Or if you go the whole hog, you you basically say well you know buy energy as a service, um, and then um, you know you you pay us. You know what you're what you're paying already or maybe a bit less and we will provide the service then it's up to us to invest in the new equipment and all the rest of it that tends to be in the commercial field and as i say in retrofit it's difficult to imagine how that would work with new build you've also got to bear in mind that new build houses you know they're not built to yeah. the right standards you know they're not built, you know, this estate will almost undoubtedly not be built to passive house standard, you know, it would be relatively easy to increase the standard of the properties substantially. 
but even to the standard they're built, the actual energy consumption per house will be relatively low compared to all the existing houses um, in in the town. So um, we haven't we haven't found a way of of um, that we can suggest. There's also an issue, you know, it's a developer on the site. They'll want to get on. They um, they um, won't want to be held up by getting involved in a complicated innovative scheme yes nick oh i just wanted to ask if hillary wanted to come in on this actually because uh, i noticed you posted in the chat there hillary do you want to unmute and, and come in hillary yeah go on, if you want to talk yeah i think the um the actual project is at such an early stage that it might be possible to persuade them to do something like has been done in Park Erin. Um, at, at this point, I quite agree that if the developer's got all his plans done, then it's very difficult to change them. But if you can get in early enough and start on the right foot, then maybe you can get a result. But, it, but is that sort of influencing the design and the development rather than perhaps in developing a community owned ESCO to, to be part yes, of? Yes, probably, mm. probably. I mean, we, we don't mind how we do it. What we're sure. all about is trying to reduce the carbon sure. footprint of sure. Prestine and whether it's by persuading developers to do the right thing or doing a um some yeah. other way yeah i certainly think it's worth pushing for higher for higher standards and to make the case that um you know you don't have to spend that much more on a property to substantially reduce its energy consumption um so yeah and tim's got his hand up as well oh uh, yes thank you um really just sort of echoing Peter Smith's comment that sort of leave it to the big boys it's it's always really frustrating looking on from the sides that the big boys tend to do what they want and don't really take account of the small bits and in terms of the the housing developments you know even a relatively small contribution from each one so if there was a sort of you know and and something like a sort of mandated PV and battery storage in each one, you've got the basis for a small local energy grid there, because although they're going to use it a lot at the same time, you've got storage shared across the whole development. Um, and it seems to me that there's, there's plenty of scope within local authority planning to mandate these things, because they've all put up zero carbon policies. And yes. we look at Paris, they've got a lovely policy there but they've almost sort of, we've done the policy, that's it, we can shut up till 2030 now. And it yes, just yes. seems that you know, there's, there's no real progress. We've had a little bit of lip service and it's ground to a halt. And I think you know, the, we do need to keep going. The one for me we touched on earlier, and sorry I'm ranting slightly, um, was the local hydro. I'm living up on top of a hill outside Van Idlois. I've got 30 foot drop. It's a seasonal only, so you know, there was nothing in the stream in the summer, but there's potential for half a kilowatt. Now that's very small, but it contributes. And I just think that you know, all of these things, we're looking for lots of small contributions rather than necessarily one big one. Although I do understand that you know, having a banker somewhere that can fill the slots, you know, the empty slots is quite good. And it does seem to me again, you know, we went back talking about um, export capability and the likes on the, the substations. If a lot of this is local, then really it's a net zero effect on the substation and it needs a bit more imaginative treatment, um, which is something that perhaps needs mandating from a much higher organizational level than we can work at. So you know, there's, there's a role for lobbying. Hey, I'll, sh I'll shut up now, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think I think there were there were three really good points there. Um, <laughs> I think the question of scale is is a very interesting one. Um, 
because when you look at you know some of the larger wind turbines or solar farms or whatever that are up in the sort of you know 50 megawatt size and then you look at the sort of community scale which tends to be in the you know up to 50 kilowatts <laughs> so that's a thousandth of the size then you you start to think well you know is it worth doing and i think i think very much it is worth doing at that sort of level but if we're getting down to the sort of kilowatt level or less then you know that that's a good thing for individuals to be doing but not necessarily worth the effort of a you know a community energy group to be putting a lot of work into so uh, they could be encouraging individuals to to you know undertake such things um but it it, it probably not worth you know their time and effort they would be better off pursuing slightly larger projects um local grids well yes there is a scheme i think i mentioned it in the clonity report um in is it somerset or devon where a housing association is putting in pv and batteries and a local grid for the site but that is a housing association site um and so they can they can say to their tenants you haven't got your own mains meter you're on a sub meter which is what you need to do in order to create this sort of local grid potential i'd be surprised if a developer would be would be happy to do that for houses that he's selling that most people would 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 find that a bit strange that they were tied into a a local grid and only had a sub meter and we're getting their bills from a third party rather than from directly from an energy supplier and i've forgotten what the third point was now i think you're right there dave though it's it's, it's both a cultural change and a mandatory sort of change isn't it it's, it's yeah. a, oh yes the other the other one was about um councils uh influencing development and this is something i've been working on for years we were trying to get shropshire council to uh dictate higher higher standards for house building you know um 15 years ago um and there was this thing called the merton rule where whereby um i think the the london borough of merton brought in this thing mandating uh, you know higher standards than building rigs there's been a lot of pushback on it from government um <clears throat> they don't like it um the developers don't like it and there is a thing there for anything like that there is a viability test so all all the house builders have to say is if if you do this we won't be able to afford to develop the site and what they mean is we won't be able to afford to get the profit margin that we expect which is uh, i can't remember the figure now but i remember when i heard it it, it seemed very high to me uh, <laughs> But that's, in the wrong trade. So, yeah. so a council, a council might say you've got to do this, and and the, and the builders just turn around and say um, it doesn't meet the viability test. Uh, go away. So yeah, I hope that's your three issues covered. And we've got Duncan with his hand up. So two two points. Brief brief one on your last point, Dave. Um, profit margin, one hundred and fifty million pounds for the manager of whichever that housing company was. Um, Second is a purely political point that given the failure of COP27 uh, to get governments to commit to you know, lower carbon emissions, I think um, it really is down to communities to do the, do the work for them. And you know, we've got to um, start and act as beacons for communities throughout the country and for that matter, worldwide. Yes. Okay, um, that, that's a good point, Duncan, thank you. Um, the other thing to say about new housing developments is that um, we were looking at a scheme um, in Worcestershire where with a new with a new bill doing shared loop ground source heat pumps. Um, I don't think a new new build housing is particularly suited to a, a larger heat network because the heat the heat demand for each property should be so low that that the the whole infrastructure of a of a complete heat network should be should be too expensive um so um but there there is 
work doing being done on shared loop ground source heat pump schemes, particularly by a company called Kenza. The main problem with that is that the government funding that used to cover such schemes has no longer exists. So you can get a grant for a heat pump and you can get a grant for a heat network covering 100 plus houses if you're off gas grid or 200 houses if you're on gas grid. There is nothing in between. So um, and the 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 money that was available would have would have been able to go would have been able to contribute to new build housing for which normally there were no grants at all. So uh, yeah, at the moment, uh, unfortunately, we 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 can't see an, uh, a, a way forward for for getting involved um, in this particular new build. Housing site. If I if I if I do come across anything of interest um, that I that I'm um, either something new or something I haven't been aware of up to now, then we will obviously uh, pass that on. But um, yeah, the other the other possibility is around heat networks. Um, now, uh, the big uh, example of of a uh, sort of community heat network going in is Swaff and Prior in Cambridgeshire. Um, they've been working on this for a long time. So they've got a they've got an energy centre which is using um, heat pumps, uh, and that's pumping heat uh, uh, around the uh, the village of Swaff and Prior. We're also working on a similar project in Bishop's Castle. We are um, uh, looking uh, looking to actually fit a wind turbine in Bishop's Castle to power the heat pump because if the heat pump was buying electricity directly from the grid, it wasn't be vi wouldn't be viable. So it's quite a big undertaking to to go for you know not only work on the heat network but also on the wind turbine. And it's something you've got to get a very high sign up um, for to uh, to make a scheme viable. You know, we, we you can't be taking heat networks pipes down a road, and you know, only ten or twenty percent of of um, people are signed up uh, signed up for it. Um, it'll be very interesting to the the Swaff and Prior one is being. Um, um, progressed. Uh, it's actually being run and um, financed by Cambridge uh, Council rather than uh, through a community energy scheme, which is a slight shame because if it was a community energy scheme with a share offer, then we'd be able to uh, have a full um, uh, analysis of their of their costs. But uh, we hear it is eye wateringly wateringly e expensive. Um, so um, and. Generally, it works better with places that uh, have got oil and um, uh, LPG heating. Um, so this could be a possible future for, um, uh, I think Pristine's on gas, isn't it? Um, Clanurative Wells has got an LPG network, but apparently it's at a uh, equivalent price to Maine's gas. Um, so uh, Clenvoclin also has um, an LPG network, but I think it's more expensive. So again, it's a scheme that could be could be looked at. Uh, we will be releasing some studies on the Bishop's Castle project shortly. So if if people are interested in a heat network, that um, that that could be looked into. Um, but again, it's a bigger scheme with a with a long with a long um, time frame. Uh, it's it's not something that's going to happen um, quickly. Uh, Dave, on um, I don't know if you mentioned the um, the actual heat generation source on on that. I, if you did, I missed it. But but there is a question uh, in the chat which was around biodigesters um, and chicken farms, basically poultry and poultry waste, etc. Um, is this a possibility, you know, in terms of being the sort of the generation source for, for uh, heat within one of those networks? Because because Paris is now inundated with um, with poultry units, basically, uh, we're causing lots of knock on effects in terms of nitrogen seepage into uh, into rivers and the like, you know, or potassium. Or, I'm not a chemist, whichever whichever 
bad substances is leaching into the rivers and, and causing lots of biological damage there. So is, is do we know in terms of um, uh, bioenergy where it stands at the moment and, and, and the best feedstocks, etc.? Well, yes. Um, I mean, there, there has been a lot of work going on in, uh, into sort of anaerobic digestion. Um, it's uh, I'm not aware of any community energy scheme that's gone down that route. I think most biodigesters are sited on farms or at factories. Um, I know I've done some work with a carrot factory up in Lincolnshire and they, they've fitted a biodigester um, and then they're using the gas for heating the, um, um, heating the factory and the offices. Um, if you're, the trouble is that the digestate, the, the, the actual chicken waste is a, is a waste. And as soon as you start moving waste from one site to another, you get wrapped up in all the sort of waste uh, um, regulations, which, which can prove um, very difficult. So if you could, if you've got, and chicken farms don't tend to be very near to where you, you want the heat. Yeah. So um, one of the things we're looking at in Bishop's Castle is that there is a sawmill and the sawmill has fitted a very large boiler uh, that is fed on wood waste, basically. So one of, one of the options in Bishop's Castle is to, is to make use of, um, uh, spare wood waste to and spare capacity in that biomass boiler to be uh, inputting heat into the network. There is some concern about being too reliant on on that one company. Um, and um, yeah, so so we're looking into that, but not into into biodigestion at, at this point. Okay. Peter. Um, Dave, yes, I was very interested in your comment about the Merton law relating to new build housing yeah. and the catch-22 clause about viability test. Yes. If some form of community energy came along and said, we can introduce capital that makes your project viable so that you get the same profit, is there any mileage in, in that sort of approach? Because my understanding is the difference between a standard build and if you like a passive house is something like 10% or maybe 15,000 pounds per house. Yes. Now, if, the... if, if capital could be found that paid for that and recovered it on the redu reduced energy costs, is there a business case? Yeah, that's that I think would be, uh, as I say, is perfectly possible in the retrofit market, particularly uh, the commercial retrofit market. So if you're dealing with a, a factory or an office block or a care home and you know what the current energy consumption is, and then you can, you can uh, work out your bills and you can work out a way of paying, the care home to pay you something out of the savings they're making from their bills. I think it's a much harder case to make with a new bill property. So, um, you know, if you're then putting putting a charge, if you like, onto a new bill property, because it will be um, theoretically using less energy. So, I mean, what happens if if the person who's buying the house actually doesn't use much energy you know they're they're, all, they're already the sort of person who who would only have the heating on low and 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 wear jumpers and is out at work all day and 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 out on the allotment or wandering the hills of an evening you know because of the amount of energy people use in a house varies enormously mm, yeah. um so you know if you've got you know you know, elderly people who are who are you know at home most of the time and need the heating up high, then then the, you know the figures would work out very well. But um, you know, I I think that's a really difficult uh, case to make. Um, um, yeah, okay. I'm not sure how that would work. Okay, thanks. 
So do we have any other questions over wind, hydro, heat networks, or the new build housing? We have I, I was just going to say, Dave, that um, uh, I allowed plenty of time, and I was thinking, oh, it's, it's always difficult to encourage people to ask questions. We'll have plenty of time, but but we'll need to <laughs> not with it, not with on everything. So not um, with this, not with this uh, group, group, Nick. It was yeah. like this uh, when I did the face-to-face uh, -face workshop. Yes, there were. Enough, you knew better than I did there. So, yeah. so I just wondered if we need to uh, to crack on a bit in terms of the second, the next section. Uh, I think I think we've got we've got one more hand exactly, up. Let's take exactly. that, and then we, we we're we're only an hour in. So uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Tim. Hang on. Right. Um, yeah. Just you know, listening to all that you've said, Dave. Um, it strikes me that heat networks just seem to have a very high capital cost and you're generating energy sort of and losing it along the way. Um, so the one thing that everyone pretty much is connected to is the electric grid. And so the focus really to me seems to be to look at how to generate and use that locally. And I think you, you did comment about small schemes not being viable, but if you have lots and lots of small schemes, it really does add up. And I think you know, there's, it's, it's where you know, we, we looked at a sort of community energy. And yes, you need some sort of um, banker who will provide the fill in, but that's where the, you know, the grid is available always. But if you can trade it locally, then you get the, the balance of, of good. Um, I think on the new build housing bit, we just seem to be terribly, terribly unambitious. You know, it requires you know, government to listen to the science, follow its zero carbon rules, and just mandate that the developers do do these things. And I know that's not necessarily for this form, it's a bigger political question. But, you know, if, if they're talking about it, not doing it, as someone said, COP27 didn't do very much because we're not doing it. You know, the profits are there. You know, is there really a significant difference between you know, sort of 150 million profit and 125 million profit? Um, because it's all you know, a huge amount of money. And for the sake of the general good, you know, the, a little readjustment mightn't come amiss. So sorry, not really questions, but just points that I think, you know, I think we need to focus the energy into pushing at a higher level to get more more support for doing things at a lower level so i'll yes. shut up now yeah um kate guys you, you haven't unmuted Hi, thanks could we I'm, I'm just interested in how come bishop's castle is able to have a wind um turbine thank you I mean, it's presumably higher than we are anyway, but it's going to be in the valley as compared to Prestine because we haven't heard the stats on that. Thanks. Yes, the the um, the proposal is for a wind turbine at Bishop's Castle. Um, now, it would be in the valley. Um, it's part the way up up the hill. The the wind speeds are slightly higher. Um, they're in the sort of five and a half meters per second range it's suboptimal it's it it's working because we can use that to supply the heat network so that we can we if it was connected to the grid it wouldn't work um because we wouldn't be getting enough money but but it's a it's a win-win situation whereby the heat heat network can buy electricity at a discount but the wind turbine gets a higher rate than if it was exporting it to the grid so that's the theory. That's the theory. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to pull it off. But there's a there's there's a lot of work to go on. Not not you know um, certainly um, uh, around planning and then and then um, um, once we've got planning for the wind turbine, then then we can really try and push ahead and 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 get the heat network um, sorted. But at the moment, it's no point in pursuing the heat network. Because it's just not viable without without um, a, a significant renewable resource to power it. Does that answer your question? Yep. 
Uh, Jackie's got a hand up, and then I think we'll move on. Okay, well, this is a this is a point that's already been brought up slightly, and it could apply to solar, but. Um... Oh, we've uh, lost you. We've lost the you, Jackie. Neighbouring roof solar. Hi. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. So Alison raised a question about whether a neighbouring roof with solar could power a um, car powering, a car battery powering yes. thing. Okay, so my general question is rather more, could excess electricity go direct to a, a, a factory which has big batteries for whatever purpose? Right. So, um, if if um, uh, so, there is a problem connecting buildings. So um, basically, the grid the grid is a is a network in it at its higher level. But when it comes down to the local level, it works more like fingers. So your connection comes off the grid as a finger into your building. Um, and the only way of getting around that is by then creating a little network off your finger so that you have one mains meter and everyone else on that little network has sub meters. And occasionally there are business parks that are run that way. Uh, you might find something like, you know, a care home with sheltered accommodation might be run that way or, you know, student flats. But most, most business parks, most box of flats, every single um, element of that, every single unit has their own mains meter. And if you're trying to connect two buildings together, then, then that's creating a potential safety issue because if they cut off the supply to one building, uh, then the electricity can come in the back door, if you like. There are ways around it, but they tend to be very expensive. So. Um, we can certainly put PV panels on a factory, and we've made suggestion for a couple of factories in uh, Clenvuclin. The question then is, is it worth fitting batteries in that factory to increase the amount of electricity they use directly? Um, and that would be very much on a case by case basis. But um, and I think I think batteries are important, but I think they they have a bigger role on a on a sort of larger scale. The trouble with putting batteries into uh, into a factory that's got PV panels on the roof is that five six months of the year the PV will either be generating very little or the factory will be using everything it can provide. The export is going to be happening in a very concentrated, you know, maximum of six months of the year. So if you fit a battery system in there for six months of the year, it's sitting there doing nothing. You've got all the ecological costs of, the, you know, the mining and all that, getting your batteries together. Now, you can get around that by then using your batteries to provide demand response. Um, so you can you could then buy in electricity at uh, night when there's spare electricity around um, and then you could sell it back to the grid um, in the afternoon between four and seven o'clock when the grid is most constrained. That's a really good thing to do. But generally, the contracts for getting into demand response, you're looking at, you know, a megawatt. You look at a thousand kilowatts to, to enter the market to get a contract to do that. Um, and it's possible that you can then you can you can get a megawatt. It doesn't all have to be on one site. You could have five 200 kilowatt batteries and, and enter a contract on that basis. But that's a that's you know, it's a whole additional level of complexity. And again, I think it's probably best to leave that to to the big boys. You know, there are very large grid uh grid connected um battery schemes uh going going 
uh, through um, that will that will be providing those grid services. Um, on a on a smaller scale, on you know, as I say, we've done this uh, project in Herefordshire and Worcestershire, which is looking at PV battery, PV panels, and batteries and EV chargers on things like village halls, and um, basically that 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 works. It's 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 a useful thing to do, but it does require grant grant input it's not it, it's not a viable scheme it's not something you could do as a community uh, energy scheme and and sell shares in and pay interest on um and the reason the reason it's important there is because your average community center doesn't use a lot of electricity during the day so without the batteries you would then be exporting um a lot of the electricity you generate i, I think we're I think we've got the, um, uh, the the constant clash, haven't we, between yes. sort of the networks that we're having to work within, yes. uh, and the desire to actually reduce energy consumption, uh, generate it locally, etc. It's always that sort of, you know, we're always clashing, aren't we, in terms of the actual yes. systems that are in in our power to influence. I think, you know, yeah. well, we've got another clash coming up, though, haven't we? Because EV vehicles are being promoted everywhere, yeah. and they are going to take electricity to run. So I don't see why you can't have a, a little station which has solar panels on the roof, which directly powers the uh, the um, chargers. Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, yeah, that's that's certainly something that's worth worth looking at. If the problem is a grid constraint, though, you have to bear in mind that, you know, you can't say to people they can only charge their cars up when the, when the sun is shining. <laughs> that, 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 that setup would still need to be connected to the grid and would still need to have the capacity to import electricity from the grid, particularly during the winter um, when the grid is most constrained um, already. OK, so it's worth it's certainly worth um, pursuing but it's it's not as simple as it might seem. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna get some water. I'll be straight back. <clears throat> I, you know, I, I think this is the, um, the, uh, the one of the big problems we all struggle with whenever we think about what we can do in terms of community energy. You know, it's, it's getting the balance right between, I suppose, the reduction side and the work we can do in our communities between that and, and the, what's viable, what's the art of the possible, I suppose, in terms of the generation side. Uh, and, and hopefully moving on to that, Dave, I think that's the next section really, isn't it? Right. Okay, so then, then we looked at rooftop solar and I'm basically gonna go through the three three towns one at, one at a time. So uh, I have um, uh, in, in the reports, all these sites are named here. I've just called them electronics factory, et cetera. So uh, um, uh, yeah, just so that people aren't don't hear. Oh, you're 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 putting PV on your roof. Well, no, you know some of these, most of these building owners we have not talked to. So these are these are potential sites. This is so we'll start with Clanerty Wells. So this is an ex hotel which is now a small electronics factory. We have talked to them. We have got uh, their energy use data. They are using significant amounts of electricity um, and it, there is the potential for a reasonable um, rooftop solar scheme here. Um, in order to get up to you know, the, the smallest size, the 22 kilowatts that we're talking about, is basically using all the roofs that are east and south facing. The larger scheme uh, includes the roofs that are west facing, which are unfortunately just north of west. So that does bring the the uh, output per kilowatt peak um, down. Um, but uh, if you're already on site, or you're already fitting, you know, half a system, then the cost of fitting the other half is going to be less. So there's some, and they would appear to have a very high um, on-site usage so this could be a could be a good site now i will just explain here so uh the kilowatt is the capacity i think we did discuss this back in um august kilowatt hours is the actual 
uh, energy that's produced. So 54 kilowatts is the power. That's the maximum that it could kick out. A kilowatt hour, that's basically a unit on your electricity meter. That's what you're paying 33p for at the moment. So kilowatt hours per year uh, is the relevant output figure. That's the amount of energy produced. And then we have this figure where we say what the how many kilowatt hours you get for each kilowatt of capacity in a year. And um, if you're if you're in a south facing location down on the south coast, you might be up to a thousand kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak in a year. Uh, in this part of the world, then uh, you'd struggle to get over about 860, 880. So you can see that this is uh, significantly lower than that. Um, so we've got about 10%. We're losing about 10% on output because of the orientation of the panels. Very few of them are south facing and some of them are slightly north of west. But the, that, that can be compensated for by the high on-site usage. Okay. The second proposal was for an activity center. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't use this roof right at the front of the building because that white strip is a very large dormer window. And there's also another, another dormer window on this uh, side here, and there's some shading from trees. But there is room for a small, relatively small system um, on the activity center itself. Uh, we haven't got usage data, but we think with such a small system and with good usage during the day for things like kitchens, whatever, then we would expect a fairly high, um, high usage. The other possibility here is that is for a ground mounted scheme and and the ground mounted scheme could be almost any size, but we've we've proposed uh, 135 kilowatts. Um, it's all south facing. The output is um, uh, is high uh, per, per, per kilowatt peak, um, but because it's a much bigger system, then a, a much less of it would be used on site. We'd be we'd be getting a much higher export on that, and then obviously that would need checking with the with the DNO as to whether that would be would be feasible. We also looked at school. You know, there's room for about 36 kilowatts on the school, and that's got a reasonable output, 816 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per year. With a school, um, they're quite good because they do have energy use during the day, uh, but of course they're normally shut at weekends and and for six weeks over the summer holidays and also half terms and, and whatever. So you know. If you can get to 50% used on site uh, with a school, um, you're you're doing well. There's also issue about um, bureaucracy around school sites. It's not impossible, but it can take a while. Now, uh, one of the things uh, that we're suggesting is that a number of the sites that we've looked at are owned or run by Paris County Council. So rather than each group, trying to go to their local school or leisure centre and saying, you know, we'd like to do this, would you be interested? I think there's, there's, uh, 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 it would be much more effective to go directly to Paris County Council and say, look, we've, we've got a range of buildings here um, and, and we can include Clannedlois in this as well, because I know Clannedlois, uh, one of the roofs they're looking at is a school site. Um, so we can go in at a fairly high level. Um, um, and I'm suggesting that Pavo might be might be well placed to do this, but um, Nick hasn't actually answered my <laughs> suggestion on that one. But um, uh, um, yeah, we, we can discuss that later when we get to um, next steps. Uh, Duncan. Uh, yes. You, uh, you've, you've already uh, stolen my thunder there. I was going to say that the Tanedlois Futures Project have got a scheme for 
um, the Llanidloes High School and Primary School, including the Leisure Centre. This has been worked out by the Big Solar Co-op, um, potentially, I think it's 150 kilowatt peak. Yep. There's um, actually, it features in a slide in, in about 10 minutes time. Oh, does it? Okay. Should, yeah, I, should, should, I, should I shut up? <laughs> no, I'm just warning. Right. I'm just okay. saying that 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 is okay. coming. Thank you. You you, you pin uh, as a, as I said, you stole my thunder. Um, yes. Yeah, so so we've, this this was started off because the teachers at the school were very keen on the idea. We've developed the proposal and it's got the support of the governors, and now it's with Powys council to make a final decision and i was i was going to suggest before you mentioned it that being as there are you know obviously more than one school yes. roof schemes uh in planning that we ought to uh, get together to submit yes. them jointly certainly and there is a new regime at, at paris county council who should be very receptive to exactly such exactly. a such a uh an approach yeah okay thanks so um, I've done a quick chart. I don't think this is actually in the Clanerty Wells uh, report. Uh, I'm happy to put it in as as an uh, uh, as an amendment. So we've uh, the activity centre is obviously uh, the ground mounted is the biggest site. Uh, then we've got the school, we've got the small factory, and we've got the activity centre roof. So. We could be looking at something like 200, 250 kilowatts if we could get all roofs approved, which is obviously uh, uh, a very big, a very big if. But that's the source of potential that we've found in Clenotive Wells. Uh, and the average there over the whole thing would be uh, producing around 820 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per year. So that's quite reasonable. Uh, Prestine, um, the advantage of Prestine is it's it's a slightly bigger town, uh, it's got more factory units um, and uh, various other buildings, so we did find more opportunities in Prestine than in Clonerty Wells, uh, including this small manufacturing unit. Now this is a very interesting one. Um, we they are aware we have contacted them they've given us our their energy data we actually spent oh an hour hour and a half talking to them uh when we visited pristine um they do have two other buildings but one of them is basically storage and one is offices but it's got two separate meters in it i think and the roofs aren't very good so it's this small manufacturing unit um, is uh, is the best bet. Um, there would need to be some action taken on these trees to the south. They need they need um, cutting back basically in order for us to to get four rows of panels on. Um, but there should be a high on-site usage, and they're they're very interested. Um, they actually make uh, this is this is a manufacturing unit they make uh, inflatable cushions for medical use so things that help you slide people on and off beds and stuff like that there's a lot of welding so there's a lot of of sort of pulse electricity use so one of the things we want to do with this is actually fit some energy monitoring um, on their meter and then we can get five minute um, energy readouts to say whether this is whether um, whether it's too sort of pulsy to really make use of the um, of the PV, uh, particularly if the welders happen to be get triggering at the same time, then there's a huge huge pulse of of electricity demand, um, which uh, which would then limit the um, um, the usefulness of the PV, but if if it's reasonably if it reasonably averages out over the day then we'd be looking at something like 70 percent used on site um we also looked at the leisure center this is a really good site um we've got their energy use data from their display energy certificate 
uh, which uh, all public buildings should have a display energy certificate. Uh, we've got 76 kilowatts on here, 780 kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak per annum, um, because quite a lot of them are east facing. But those east facing panels give you a better spread of use during the day, so they should help to keep the uh, direct use up. And of course, uh, it's open seven days a week as well. So that's and and across the summer. So that that would be that would be a plum site, and that would be top of my list for going to Paris County Council with. There are also some manufacturing units. This factory is actually uh, it's split in two. There's two separate tenants in here, so we've. Um, we've split and um, there's about 50 kilowatts on each array. Obviously here, we, we haven't talked to the occupants of the building. It's probably rented, so we need, would need to talk to the landlords as well, but it's certainly a scheme that's well worth pursuing. There is another one, an identical unit, that's occupied by a company who say they're going to fit PV themselves. But if they if they decide not to, if they um, if they if they don't get round to doing it themselves, then um, this would be a uh, that would be another really good opportunity. So that would be slightly higher. That would be about 120 kilowatts on that roof. Um, the other thing I I could say about this is that I I found this an interesting case. This company. This company have got have been taken over basically by a parent company, and they said um, they cannot get uh, capital for investment. They have it, they find it really hard to get any money out of the company for investment. So no matter how much they might like to do this themselves, it's just not going to happen. So they were they were really pleased when we came along and said, look. You know, we can do this for you. Uh, you wouldn't need to provide any capital, and we will provide a discount on your um, electricity. Um, they were very, very uh, interested in that idea. Um, so the Prestine sites, we had a few more, um, uh, about 200, 240 kilowatt capacity on. on uh, but with uh, the possible additions of um, more roofs at the school and the other factory, then it could be up to 300, 370 kilowatts. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's, and the average again, 816 uh, isn't, isn't bad, but there are a couple of very small roofs in there. The care home's fairly small. The, the uh, school is fairly small. Um, and the um, small manufacturing unit is, is relatively small. We go to Clanvucklin and here we have one, oh, Anthony, so you have a question? Yeah, yeah, just on that, um, that small uh, production unit in uh, Prestine, I was interested there, you were talking about the pulse nature of demand for things like welding. Uh, wouldn't that be a good um, uh, installation to consider a battery as part of it? So you've got a, a means of satisfying peak demand when it is that sort of pulsing. Yes, yes, that would certainly be worth be worth looking at. Yeah, that that is somewhere where your battery would be would be far more useful than uh, on, on most sites. Um, and then we then we went to Clanvaclin and Clanvaclin you know, is a, is a reasonable sized town. It does have uh, quite a lot of factory units. It has a secondary school, it has a library, it has. Um, so we, we, and medical center, we found quite a few good roofs in Clanvaclin. This is by far the best. Um, so it's a relatively large factory. Um, obviously with this one, we'd need to check about the strength of the roof. Um, but, you know, theoretically that, southwest facing roof could could fit um, nearly 200 kilowatts on it which would be brilliant potentially we could also use this uh, southeast facing roof to give um, 
uh, more output um, in the morning. Um, but there's an access issue about because of these lower roofs down here that would that would um, might make that difficult. So uh, that's an interesting possibility. We also looked at the school. It's quite a sizable school. Um, there are some flat roofs which appear to be felted, so there could be an issue there, but they were actually working on this area of flat roof while we were there. So presumably that's in reasonable condition. Now there is a roof, this south east facing roof has got a, a low slope on it. There are some other roofs down here, but there is a hill behind and some trees. So we're assuming that these would be too shaded but there might be possibility of fitting in, fitting in more. But we've, we've, we've got an 84 kilowatt scheme there fairly easily. Um, and again, as a school, we'd be looking at something like 50% used on site. Next door to the school is actually the leisure, leisure center, which we would have room for another 55 kilowatts and that would have a higher direct usage also, just the other side of the car park is the library, and that could fit 32 kilowatts um, with a reasonably high um, output and reasonably high. There are offices in there as well as, so the library isn't open every day of the week. There was a community center bit, which uh, seems to have reasonably good use, but there are also offices in there which will be used uh, during the week. So. So looking at the Clan Vauclin sites, if we if we were to include them all, it comes out to 470 kilowatts. Um, but quite a few of these are relatively small, down to six kilowatts at the Cross Keys. Um, the Cross Keys is a sort of uh, cafe that's run by a community interest company. So it would be really nice to be able to uh, fit some, and they're, they're all electric. Um, their heating's electric, they're, they've got a, a kitchen and bar, and, and it's the sort of place where the lights are on um, virtually every day of the year because the windows are, you know, relatively small. It's, as you might guess from the name, it's, a, it's an ex-pub. So that would be a really nice thing to do. Now, big solar, ideally, are looking at sites above 50 kilowatts. So Big Solar would be very interested in these three sites at the top. They might be interested in the library uh, because that um, would have a fairly high direct use and has got a fairly high output. They would not be so interested in these other sites, um, these other smaller sites, but it might be possible to get one or two of them included in a portfolio um, as a sort of community benefit if we can, if we can bring the other bigger sites on board. Uh, so I've just compared the three towns there. So, you know, if, if you could get all the roofs going in, in, in that we've identified in these three sites, there'd be uh, about a megawatt of production of capacity rather, um, nearly 900,000 kilowatt hours a year um, with uh, Clamworthy Wells representing a quarter of that um, pristine, uh, a third of it, and Clemvoclin, 43%. Now we have also, um, I happened to bump into Chris Lord Smith from Clannidlois on Saturday at the Big Solar Gathering, and he mentioned that they have uh, completed a report on um, community energy. And I mean, so it's a much more wide ranging report that they've done. Uh, which is looking at the actual energy use of the town and various other options. But included in that, they've looked at uh, community energy possibilities. Um, and they found 11, um, 11 roofs that they thought were suitable for PV. Uh, one of these already had PV on it, uh, which, is, which is not unusual. People often don't, you can't see uh, PV, it's tucked away. One has a very low electricity demand on site and three have multiple metering, meaning it would be too expensive to install systems on them. Um, so uh, that, that brings them down to six sites. Uh, two, two are under consideration, two have yet to respond and two are currently at the design stage. 
But if all the systems went ahead, a total of around uh, 1,250 kilowatt peaks would be installed. So that's um, that's just bigger than the three three towns that we've um, um, we've looked at. But I think that figure is is relating to all 11 roofs. It will, if it's relating to the six, then that is a very high, that's an average of 200 kilowatts uh, for, for each of the six sites. So I could be corrected on that. I don't know if Duncan knows, but I think that's the, um, and then uh, as Duncan mentioned, uh, they, are, they have put a proposal for the, um, the school's site, which also has the pool and leisure center co-located. So there, um, they are looking at um, uh, 128 kilowatts on the high school and 45 kilowatts on the primary school. Um, and I'm not sure how the, how the leisure center works into that, whether it's got its own meter, but it hasn't got a, uh, a separate PV system. Duncan, do you, you're, oh, you've got your hand up anyway. Do you want to come in here? Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, as, as the leisure centre, I think that um, is supplied from, from the schools or something, I'm not sure. So it would use some of the electricity from the two schools PV. As, as the total capacity, um, it's all in the, the full uh, report of the first, five months of the project which I'm happy to share with anybody right. but I, I seem I, I think uh, the school plus two other large factory roofs one in Newtown one in Welshpool um, do get close to a thousand kilowatt peak just those three roofs um, right maybe, okay maybe wrong so, I'm, I'm just talking from memory but uh, right. I, I think that's so, so you were looking at the wider area, not just Planet Lois. Well, it, it just happens that um, the one in Newtown and one in Welshpool contacted Chris um, because they'd heard, I think, what we were doing or people who knew him. Uh, so he he's started uh, looking at those other two sites, um, uh, you know, just because they, they were interested. I'm not yeah. sure what stage either of the the new town or the Welsh pool ones are at, but I think with with the school potentially we're talking about close to um, a thousand uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, and just just briefly mention that the one the one roof with very low usage is the community is the uh, community centre in Lidlois, of which Nick is a trustee, um, and we we have. Uh, started looking or thinking about the idea of PV on that roof with associated EV charging points, but really to make it viable, we would need to start a Plinid Lois Energy Club um, to trade renewable uh, electricity in the Plinid Lois area. So we're, we're actively looking at that, but again, fairly early stages and it was all disrupted by the uh, the massive spike in energy prices and the instability of the market. Uh, but I think it's sort of on track now. Um, it will partly depend on us getting further funding to, to carry on looking at, at that particular issue. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Duncan. So, do we have any questions on the solar installations um, proposed? Before we, before we take those questions, Dave, I was just wondering, does it, do people want to take a break or, or just have sort of five, ten minutes just to uh, get a cup of tea or something? Or, or do you want to yep. just keep on going? Do, do you guys tell me? I think, I think five minutes would be very useful. Yes, please. That would be great. Yes, please. Do we come back at quarter two? Great. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. see you shortly. Okay, so so we're, we're back in, in terms of part two. I hope everybody's um, managed to come back from that break. And uh, uh, as the as the
question says on the screen, I guess, Jay, David, it's open to questions in terms of, um, of solar installations then. I can see Peter's got his hand up. Peter, do you want to come in on this? Yes, thank you. Um, Dave, you, you mentioned um, in the case of the small manufacturing unit in Prestine that they, um, they didn't have capital to put PV on. Um, I think if I remember rightly, their, their, their issue was that their um, main company insists on a return on capital of two to three years. Um, and that obviously obviated any sort of PV project. Um, so we've got sort of two types of, of potential application, one in which people who have the capital, but they're looking for 30 to 50% return, not 10%. And then there are um, applications who basically don't have the capital. Does um, Big Solar have a preference for the type of project? Obviously, the bigger the roof, the greater the potential for decarbonisation, and they have a minimum limit. But if given two roofs with adequate capacity, do you prefer um, raising the money for an outfit that basically does doesn't have the capital to do it, or an outfit that would love you to pay for it, so it doesn't bother them. Um, I, I don't think there's there's a uh, a preference there, um, providing they're they're happy for us to go ahead, happy happy to sign the the agreements. Um, whether it's uh, you know a problem higher up the chain or or whatever, I mean. As far as I'm concerned, most most companies that have got a viable uh, roof and you're using enough electricity should be doing it themselves. You know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, you know and so a, any scheme that we do, you could argue, well, the company should be doing it themselves, but for various reasons, they're not. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I know that one of the there were there were three roofs that are going ahead early next year with the big solar co-op. Two of them are factory roofs with sort of 100, 150 kilowatts on each. One of them, they they they've both got parent companies. And one of them they said, oh, the parent will just not provide investment. You know, it it it's it's not not even worth us asking. In fact, I think they had they had a project that had failed because the parent company just said no. The other one was an interesting case in that the parent company has actually put in carbon reduction targets, um, and and so you know the plant manager was was wow you can help you can help us meet our carbon reduction target with no capital investment. That's brilliant. So, you know, we're going ahead with both of those, not really care what their motivation is, providing they're prepared to um, sign up. OK, thank you. So a semi-related question, but it's to do with, I suppose, with, with tenancy and occupancy. So, so um, a, a lot of these projects look like leisure centres are, are keen and schools, you know, you've got... Leisure centres in Paris are, are, as we know, there's a, a, a sort of a, a separation between the ownership being with Paris County Council and um, the, the actual running of those facilities being with Freedom Leisure, I think is, is most of them, if not all of them across Paris. So how does that work, Dave, in terms of, you, you mentioned it, some of the factory units as well, there's some are owned, some are leased, as it were, you know, what sort of security of tenures should we be looking at in terms of how we do this? Yeah. Um, well, a security of tenure is um, is obviously uh, a good thing. Um, I mean, the way that the big solar does it is that they they assign each company a sort of risk profile, if you like. Um, so, you know, do they do they seem to be a stable company? Are they expanding? Um, um, but then, you know, if you were to put in, you know, it's a rented property that their, their current lease is only for 10 years and that would add to the risk factor. Um, the important thing with if it's a tenanted building is that you need the permission of the landlord so that, you know, if the tenancy does change, then um, it, it, the agreement can then move to the to the new 
um, occupant of the building. Now, um, they would always have the, they would have to have the ability to say, no, thanks, we don't want the solar on our roof anymore. Um, in which case, you know, you would have to consider going and taking it down and, and putting it somewhere else. And that's one of the advantages of not having the feeding tariff is that you can do that. When we had the feeding tariff, you could only claim the feeding tariff on the building and, or actually on the meter that the equipment was originally fitted to. And as soon as you move it to another building, it becomes secondhand equipment and not eligible for the feeding tariff. So any schemes with the feeding tariff are actually at great risk from you know, a, a building becoming unoccupied um, or demolished or, <laughs> you know, uh, whereas here we do, have a, we do have a bit more flexibility. Obviously there are costs involved in taking panels down, moving them, fitting them to a new site. So it's not ideal, but it's not necessarily the end of the world. But the, the, the big problem is how do you persuade the building owner that this is a good thing to do? Um, because really there isn't room in the finances to offer the occupant of the building a reasonable discount and offer something to the landlord. So our line, or well, the, the big solar line is that um, the landlord benefits by having an improved building that would be is that the tenant is more likely to be able to stay in, and it would, should be easier to relet if the tenant does leave. Um, and um, but that's you do have to have a, a you know a landlord that's interested. We did have one proposal in Worcestershire that I thought was a really interesting one, and we talked to the uh, we talked to one of the owners of the building, and he was fine. He was up for it, but when he put it to it's basically a, a trust, and he put it to the board of the trust, the other members of the trust said, "No, no, no we we want something out of this. We can't let them put PB on our on the, our roofs, and and they don't pay us anything." And so it didn't happen. So their tenants lost out, which was a great shame. Yeah. From, from a sort of a, a charity governance point of view, I can understand where they're coming from as well in terms of, you know, the full market value and all that type of stuff in terms of what's in the best interest of the charity, as it were. But uh, yeah, difficult one. Well, I think, I think, yeah, that wasn't a charity. That was more like a pension all right. a pension well, trust yeah. type arrangement. I think it's a, I think it's actually the previous owners of the building had sold yeah. the, right. uh, they owned the business, they sold the business, but kept the building and put it into some sort of pension. That's, trust. that's kind of trust, yes. Okay. That's the kind of trust, not a charitable trust, yes. So, uh, yeah, uh, Jackie's got her hand up. Okay, so I've sort of modelled some of the information we got from the last one, the last session, and um, I just want to recap the arrangement. So Big Solus uh, gets the factory in Llanvoclin to sign off, they are then the owners of the solar panels. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So yeah. they then they then charge the factory owners a slightly lower charge for their electric. Yes. And so um, they are keen to take it. Yes. And so then what happens to the, the difference? What ha where, where does the community benefit here? It doesn't, does it? The only benefit is the people who've got shares in big solar. Is that correct? Right, well, th this, is, this is, bearing in mind, big solar is one of the options. It's not the yeah. only option, it's one of the options. Under, under big solar, basically, um, any surpluses created will be invested in new solar arrays. So um, there won't be money for, you know, um, village halls and, and play equipment and community orchards and, and all the rest of it. Um, so, but, you know, it, it, we are looking at a number of sites where, where we have things like the Cross Keys Cafe, which would not normally be viable as a community, as a big solar scheme, but it could be included as, you know, 
as as the community benefit out of you know they would still be being sold their electricity but the the um uh you know it would enable schemes to go forward that would not be viable without using those that surplus if you like so that's where the and and of course the other big community benefit is is um carbon reduction right of course is that okay thanks the next step yeah so. that's it but there's another question sorry, relating yes. to sorry we have a a member of Brace who's just uh, moved into a council house and is interested in knowing um, whether he can uh, do anything for his, um, uh, apart from, could he, I don't know what he's asking really, but uh, he, he wants to know whether he can do anything in terms of reducing carbon emissions and lowering his electricity bill. And now he is in a council house. now. If we were to get a deal with Powys County Council, do you think that, that that might be part could be part of that? It's um, when we when we had the feeding tariff, there were a number of schemes that was fitting uh, PV panels to sort of housing association, social housing type. Uh, the best example is probably South Staffordshire Community Energy. Uh, they were invited by Cannock Chase District Council to fit um, PV panels on, on their housing stock, uh, which is obviously a really good thing to do. Um, they found it, e even with the feeding tariff, they found it a challenging project um, and, and a lot of work, and um, they're not sure that they would repeat it. Um, and we no longer have the feeding tariff. So um you know the the thing is that most people's electricity bills might seem high but their actual amount of electricity that they use particularly during the day over the summer months is relatively low so um unfortunately we do not have a model at the moment whereby we can work with um individual householders as on a community energy basis i mean one yeah I mean, it's again, maybe that's, you know, pressure on pressure on to Paris County Council to say, why aren't you fitting PV to to your um, to your housing stock? Um, but they're likely to come back and say, well, you know, we can't do that because um, it's difficult for us to charge our charge our tenants for the electricity we're we're supplying to them and that. You know, they would probably argue that they're, they're better off investing in, you know, larger schemes, either ground mounted or on their own offices or or something like that. So I, I think I think the way to help individual householders is through the sort of energy advice route and signposting them to to the various grant schemes and things like the Robert Owen um um zero interest loans um uh, stuff like that rather than getting involved trying to fit equipment to their houses i was going to come in on that actually uh, dave because actually the source of most of the uh, money that's available as a zero interest loan is is from the council so that's i suppose yes. that's how they're actually looking at how they can get domestic properties um uh invested in and those loans are not just for um for pvs either they're also for you know um uh, insulation measures as well so you know yes. it's worth inv investigating that offer actually uh, it's not going to be a fit for everybody but but certainly you know the the, the notion is it's an interest free free loan and the payback is is covered by the savings that will be made etc you know? yes but we yeah. can have a chat about that jackie outside of this meeting perhaps yes I mean, the, the, the problem is that that probably doesn't help the people who need it most. Exactly. <laughs> um, but there are there are there are grant schemes out there for people who are who are, you know, in more need. Um, and they are they are starting to improve. I'm not sure actually if HUG supplies in Wales. Wales is probably different. But in England, there's now a thing called the HUGS grant which is eligible to anybody with household income under 30k and um you know you can do some interesting and uh, i think you've got to be off the gas grid as well but that's 
and have an E per C rating of D to G. Um, um, I'm not sure if that applies in Wales, but if it does, that's worth that's worth looking into. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. That's all right. Do we have any other questions on solar before we move on? So, uh, oh, oh. so the next question is what what are the next steps? So, I don't know. I, I thought I'd open the floor here and see what 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 the thoughts are. Um, I was going to say around the room, but uh, around the Zoom. <laughs> Uh, as to as to what the next steps might be, where where you think uh, you might take this um, information. Does anybody want to start up, Duncan? Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm particularly interested in in the energy local or the local energy club idea, um, because you know we talked a lot about how solar PV produces a lot of electricity in the summer and uh, in the middle of the day when there's least usage. Um, but a local energy club uh, allows the marketing of uh, solar energy, uh, solar electricity within an area. Um, and certainly an, an, until everybody's got solar panels, there's going to be enough baseline usage that all your electricity if you're not using it, you'll be able to sell to somebody else who wants to use it um, at a you know better price than than from the smart energy guarantee, which was about five p a unit. Um, so, yeah, the, for, for us in Lanedlois, I think uh, pursuing the uh, Lanedlois Energy Club, um, I think is is the first most important step because we have uh you know quite a lot of pv on the roofs both the ones that we've helped to get installed and quite a few pre-existing ones um and certainly if things like the the school system roof system comes off there's a you know a big amount of electricity um say weekends and in the middle of the summer which isn't going to be used by the school which could be sold and make the whole scheme more uh, economically viable. Um, so yeah, so I, I think uh, any any area it, for, for any area, it is worth looking at a local energy club or an energy local scheme, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So we did look at we looked at energy local as part of the workshop back in August. Energy Local started in Bethesda in North Wales, where they've got a hydro scheme that was connected to the grid. And people were saying, look, we've, we're generating this hydro. Uh, the only people benefiting are the, are the shareholders at the moment. Why can't the local people benefit from, uh, from this uh, uh, electricity? And so I think it was co-op energy at the time, but they then were brought out by Octopus. Uh, agreed to run a scheme whereby uh, if you're a member of Energy Local, which means you have to sign up to their, you have to sign up to have Octopus as your uh, electricity supplier, and you need to have a smart meter, I think, then um, they can, they can, um, will notify you when the hydro is uh, generating. And if you any electricity you use during that period when the hydro is generating, you get at a slightly discounted rate. Um, it's a great idea. Uh, it has spread. I think there are something like 20 or 30 energy local groups around the country now. Um, I would say that I think it's better suited to something like a wind turbine or a hydro site that's grid connected. Uh, it's much more likely then to fit in with when local people are going to be using significant amounts of electricity. Um, not sure how it could work if you're looking at roof mounted solar whereby you're using most of the electricity uh, on site and it's only at weekends and over the summer holidays that there is any spare, whether people would think it worthwhile 
um, joining in on on that basis. Um, and uh, and obviously you've got to be at home <laughs> during the day uh, to be able to say, oh, right, the electricity is cheaper. I'm going to put my washing machine on now or charge the electric car or or get the electric welder out. Um, you know, so and and lastly, um, Energy Local is very much a, you know, it's still uh, uh, at beta stage. Shall we, shall we put it that way? It, it is uh, an, an innovation that Octopus are working with. Um, Octopus have not guaranteed that it will carry on. Um, so whilst it's of interest, if you have a renewable asset, it's certainly worth trying to set up an energy local scheme um, and um, getting more benefit to, to the uh, local residents. It would be difficult to um, feed that into a business plan as, you know, just, you know, basically the scheme's got to stack up without it. And we see it as, a, as an additional benefit that, that might, might apply. Um, so, so certainly very interesting, but I don't think it transforms the situation. Uh, Liz has her hand up and hasn't spoken yet. No, I, I was I was just going to just from an external point of view, just mention. I think from listening to all this this morning, which has been really fascinating and really useful, I think there are two two parts to, to almost the next steps. I think that I'd I'd like to hear from people about what more they need to know about certain things and there's certain elements that are flagged up whether that be heat networks I mean one of the things that I, I've been doing some work on ESCOs in the retrofit um, arena and I, I, I'd quite like to know a bit how that works elsewhere but what do people need to know that's one but the second thing is is try to pin down what to do now what what can we do and, and that, that to, to explore and really pin down perhaps nick you know with the powers county council networks so that we we bring this particular phase funded through the crf to a conclusion that actually leads to hopefully new funding or gives us some heads up because um, that's really what i've got to write really in terms of you know the so what and the what next so i hope that's helpful yep thank you liz and nick uh, yeah, no, I was just thinking in terms of that energy local conversation. Um, I had some, with the, my other hat on previous life, etc. I did have some uh, contact when that original Bethesda scheme was being set up. And it might well be worth actually, you know, um, organising a, a, a bit of a workshop around energy local and asking energy local to come and present uh, just to sort of give us the, the answer those questions directly, I think. Yep, that would be good. So uh, do we have any thoughts about, let, let's take Liz's first question first. What, what more do you need to know? Alison, let's... Uh... See, you mentioned that Big Solo was one of the options. What other financial options are there? Well, it, it's always possible that each town could set up their own community benefit society. Um, now we went through the advantages and disadvantages of this in in August. The 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 up up until fairly recently, virtually all community energy schemes were were hyper local. So you know you have you know, um, Chipping Norton have got their own community energy scheme. They've got panels on the community centre and the and the and the um, school and uh they're getting a guaranteed income from the feeding tariff so you know um they're they're reasonably happy and secure and they're getting a reasonable community benefit fund out of you know relatively minimal effort now we don't have the feeding tariff you know chipping norton if they went ahead now would be would be at great risk because you know if all their income is derived from selling the electricity. So, you know, if a building goes empty, then um, they they lose their they lose their income overnight. So, um, Share Energy's advice is that if you want to go down that route, then you need to be looking at you know, looking towards a portfolio of possibly a megawatt. Um, 
on at least 10 roofs. And what have we got in pristine? We got, you know, under 500 kilowatts. So, I mean, you wouldn't have to do all that straight away. But if you go, you, and you can go smaller, you, you can certainly do it. But, you, you know, the risks are increased. And then you've got to explain that risk to your potential shareholders and you might find it more difficult to raise to raise the funds because you know if I was buying shares in you know Clan Buckling Community Energy uh, you know one of the questions I would ask would be you know what happens if any of these buildings become empty as as you know as happens all the time so so that is, but that is still an option um there is uh there is Egni who are a Welsh-based organisation similar to Big Solar. Most of their work to date has been on schools. Um, they raised two million pounds um, and have fitted around two megawatts of PV on schools, mostly in South Wales, but there, there's some other ones around. It's well worth talking to EGNI uh, as a Welsh-based organisation to see if they're interested in any of the roofs um, on offer. The other option, which which I'm going to which I'm going to throw into the ring now, um, is that uh, you know if there is interest from four separate towns and quite a lot of individuals within Paris, then you could set up a Paris Community Energy in the same way that we've set up Shropshire and Telford Community Energy. So in Shropshire, uh, it's a slightly different story, but you know we thought rather than each town having their own community energy scheme, wouldn't it be better to have a Shropshire and Telford wide community energy scheme? You know, you've got, you've got more people who could be potentially involved in terms of board, board members and volunteers. You've got, you can develop a relationship with people like Shropshire Council and Telford and Reeking Council, you know, um, so, um yeah so that that would that would that would be the other possibility you know if people if people want something that's more locally based then uh then the option of doing a paris community energy scheme i think could be very attractive thank you and tim <clears throat> right, got myself online. Um, I was just thinking, in terms of next steps, one of the things that strikes me is living in a very rural and sort of widely separated part of the community that I do, um, a lot of the focus has been towards town-oriented schemes. Um, one of the things we did on the Lanny Futures project, we actually looked just at, you know, at the scope for a local energy trading network um, particularly with the relation to electricity, and found that the, the catchment area, in terms of the sort of Scottish power distribution, gave us quite a wide catchment. And the advantage of the, the, the trading group is that where you've got people who can't, for whatever reason, install PVs or anything else, they can still benefit um, from the reduced rates, either from the reduced background rate that the octopus partner would produce or the surpluses that the, the generating members are, are generating. Um, this was particularly relevant, I think, for, in our view, the centre of Lanny is a heritage area. It's not possible to install PV on some of the roofs because of that. But if they can pick up the benefit on others and pick up you know, an energy saving benefit in terms of cost, and given that it's green energy as well, um, there was a lot of advantage to that. So I think the idea of local energy networks is good. The idea maybe of a powis wide um, concept, given that it's such a big area, definitely has merit because powis should, um, if we can put pressure on, on the council, then the council should be a big enough operation to be able to put pressure on mm -hmm. some of the... Um, the other sponsoring authorities so yes that's a good idea not quite sure where it starts but um i suspect i know duncan's dropped out just briefly um if lanny futures project does get its further funding then i suspect we could well be interested in, in looking at that 
um, because we would hope to have some officers who we could perhaps in part focus on that part of the scheme. So that would be my thing. District heating, where I am, joke, you know, period. Uh, yeah. But electricity, definitely go for it. So yeah. it's the, the I just see there's a sort of there's a two track path. What you can do in sort of condensed communities like towns, big villages is very different from what you can do across greater powers, which, as we all know, has more sheep than people. So yeah. there we are. That's, yes. that's my thoughts. Yeah. I think with the energy local, the only requirement is you need to be in the same substation. So. And but substations in rural areas tend to cover quite a wide area. So um, yeah, that yeah, that, that was that our could... finding. Kersus, I think, is our substation. Yeah, yeah. And that but... gives quite a big flow down the valley, and good a good coverage area. Yeah. Um, thank you, Tim. Uh, Hillary. Okay. Hi there. I was just going to say for people who haven't got a suitable roofs to put solar onto, but want green electricity, they could consider in investing in Ripple Energy, who uh, run community wind farms, and their first one in South Wales, where a, a member of, and basically they deal through octopus and every time the wind blows, we get chunks taken off our octopus bill. And it's the return on it in, in terms of keeping energy costs down seems to be very similar to paying to put up solar panels on your roof. Yeah, I think I think Ripple's an interesting, slightly different take on the sort of community energy model, whereby normally, you know, you have your you have your electricity supply with somebody like Octopus or Good Energy, uh, but then you buy shares in um, in a community energy company that's fitted PV panels or wind turbine or a hydro, and Ripple has sort of brought that together. So that you you buy shares in uh, in the wind turbine, but you're rather than receiving interest. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, Richard, but uh, I, yeah. I believe this is the way it works. Rather than receiving interest, you basically get a discount on your electricity bill. Exactly. Absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's mm. quite an interesting one, uh, particularly if you wanted to invest a lot of money in community energy. Because if you earn a thousand, you can earn a thousand pounds interest tax free um, on your shares. But if you go over that, you start paying tax on it. Whereas obviously you you won't be paying tax on your discount on your on your um, electricity bill. So um, yeah, yeah, that that's an interesting um, interesting just alternative alternative take. Yeah, they they don't like you to invest more than 120% um, of your kilowatt hours right. usage per year, so that it isn't seen as a um, money-making thing yes. so much as a help with paying electricity yes. bills. And yeah. the fact that it's well, that it's, um, countrywide, even though the turbine is in South Wales, they have um, contributors to it from Scotland, Yorkshire, London, yes. and their next um, project is a, a farm of six turbines up in Scotland, and anybody can join it. Yep. They're also looking at offshore turbines because yes. ever since the um, energy price hike, the interest and the number of people contacting them has gone up exponentially. The, the other thing I was going to say with that is that that isn't a community energy 
um, project, that would be a personal investment. Yes. I don't think there's any way that that could be a community investment. Okay. No, it, but it's it, a different way. It's, it's a different way of using Yeah. Absolutely. Technically, it's community. It has shareholders yeah. who are yeah. who are a wider, you know, UK wide community who are in effect owning that owning that wind turbine. Um, yeah. I mean, the thing with that is, of course, that's that the benefit goes to the shareholders. Yes. Um, and so that's that's people like you and me who've managed to pay off their mortgage and and have a bit of spare capital that we can yeah. that we can invest. <laughs> having got having got to an age where where we're able to do that, which is great. And and um, yeah, uh, that's all well and good. The advantage of energy local is it can provide benefit to anybody. You don't have to provide capital to become an energy local me member. You just have to sign up as a uh, with Octopus as your supplier. Yes. Okay. True. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nick. Yeah, mine's a technical question related to the Paris Community Energy Setup, and and I, I think I've already answered this in my own mind actually. It, the, the the if you if you created a community energy engine across powers you'd be dealing with uh multiple network operators wouldn't you basically you'd be looking at the, the south yes and the, so it's a complication but it's not it's not impossible is it it's just yeah. a question because you each scheme is 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 in its own area and has its own connector so it just yes. it's just a multiplicity of connectors really isn't it so yeah. yes yeah and I think I think what you would want if you if you were to set up a Paris organization, I think you would need, you know, at least one person from each area to come forward to to sit on the board and be involved in a, a, a you know, in a fairly um, dedicated way. Um, you know, it would be difficult with with. Um, Paris being quite so big for, you know, to form a board of people who basically all live in Newtown. Um, uh, uh, who, who, were, who were trying to get, um, you know, renewable energy projects going in Crickowl, you know, it's, um, yeah, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work really. It needs that local connection, uh, almost yes. like a federative type of, um, yes, as it were, yeah. 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 So you could have one person who, you know, in the north of the county who deals with SPEN and somebody in the south of the county who deals with Western Power, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Alison. <clears throat> yes, mine was um, exactly along the lines of you, what you've just been saying. You know, how, how would that company work in practice? You know, how do you go about setting them up? Do you have any paid staff or is it all the volunteer board members who are organising it? I, I can imagine there's administration to deal with. Uh, what are the practicalities? Well, you, I mean, you would you would probably set it up as a community benefit society. Now, a CBS is the it's it's not quite the only legal form that can issue shares, but it is the most it's the easiest and most common uh, setup that you can you can uh, take on in order to be able to do a share issue. You can set up a CBS for 150 quid, um, and it's a fairly simple application form. Um, and then when you when you've got your registration. As a CBS, you can then go and open a bank account and and you're away, basically. I would imagine that um, certainly initially it will be a volunteer board who who then look to raising raising grants to uh, to get um, you know consultants to uh, assist them in their in their work. Um, but obviously, if, if money is available to have a, you know, if it gets to the point where, you know, having somebody to do the admin or whatever to 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 help drive it forward, rather than relying wholly on um, volunteer effort, um, then that would be a good thing to do. At the moment, Shropshire and Telford is purely uh, is like most community energy schemes is purely voluntary. Uh, but we we have raised grant money and we have had feasibility studies done by um, consultants. Um, yeah, and that's that's the way we work. It's it's possibly worth flagging up as well. There is a, a still a community energy fund available in Wales now. It's a, it's a it's a loan fund, uh, but it is designed to help with the development stages of community energy schemes as well. So you know it's it's a, it's a bit of pre-funding as it were. You know. Yes. Um, but as I say, you know, 
there is a there is a process to go through in terms of actually securing that money and you, you need to be relatively advanced down the line of having a you know a viable scheme at the end of it so it's always chicken and egg i think in terms of these yes. you know how you fund these development costs how much effort you have to put in you know voluntary effort as opposed to sort of paid staff effort I suppose, Dave, with the with the feed-in tariff being out of the mix now, uh, or, or any of the renewable heat incentives, etc., you know that does open up more possibility for for potential grant funding because it used to trip you up if you you know in terms yes. of how to set, yes. to set, to set things going in the early days. So, so I think it's a mixture, Alison, um, and I think it's also you know and and you know I'm more than happy to to. I was going to hope to hopefully get to a session. I don't think we're probably going to have time for it today around sort of governance as well. So we could actually, you know, if, if there is an interest in, in, a, uh, in a Paris community energy, then I'm more than happy to sort of lead a workshop with interested parties in terms of what that might look like. Because I suppose you don't have to go down the CBS route immediately either. No. You know, initially start off with just a, a simple constitution, see what, you know, to test the water so you're not committing yourself to a particular route. So... You know, these things can be staged, I suppose, is the best way of putting it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Um, and we did we did um we did look at the Welsh Energy Service and Community Energy Wells as resources as part of the August workshop. Um and uh, I have some slides on that further on if we if we want to show them. But um, you know, um yes, they the you're, you're right that now grants grants are um, much more feasible now that we don't have the feed-in tariff. And in fact, um, Corwin Hydro and their first hydro was built using basically a feed-in tariff. So they had a you know 100% share offer and they're paying off their share capital using the, the feed-in tariff. Their second hydro, they actually uh, missed the feed-in tariff, but they've managed to get a Welsh government grant for something like three quarters of the cost. In fact, slightly higher, I think. Um, so their share offer is only is only you know for the difference between the final cost and the and the and the government grant. Um, and um, you know, obviously, that makes raising your share capital much much easier. And uh, and takes away some of the risk as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, being in Wales, you know, you have far more opportunity for this than than uh, us poor English folk who uh, who uh, don't don't have zero interest loans available and and don't have the sort of support that the Welsh government is uh, is uh, willing to give. Uh, our heart bleeds for you, Dave. <laughs> Okay, does, does anybody have any more thoughts on uh, Liz's first question, which is what do you need to know? Is there anything extra that you that you feel, you know, or oh, we'd like to know, we, we'd like to know a lot more about heat networks, why, you know, or we'd like to know a lot more about something else, or um, we'd like to know more about, you know, how, how the big solar co-op works and anything? Duncan. Yes, sir. I, um, not so much uh, what I want to know is, is how you pursue the question of getting all the potential school schemes uh, packaged together and presented to Paris Council in a way that will encourage them to say yes. Yeah, I, I think that's a very that's a very good that's a very good question. I think we can put that under what do you need to know. We need to know how what's the best way of approaching Paris uh, County Council. Um, I don't know if Paro have got any resources that they could put into this, Nick. Um, I mean, I would, um, there are certainly some county councillors who should be very interested in this. Um, and and I'm sure there are members as well. So, um, you know, I, I think we're potentially pushing at an open door. I, I'm sure, you know, if we compared notes in terms of who those councillors might be, we could come up with a list of three or four of them or, you know, even more. Yes. Um, possibly, yeah, actually more, actually, um, and across the political spectrum as well. So not just yes. uh, cabinet members or, or Lib Dems, as it were. So um, I think I've got an in. 
Um, Duncan, I think I've got an end to, to how I can launch that conversation, put it that way. Um, and I suppose it's really just a question of making sure that we're organised at the other end of it before we have that conversation so we can moot it as an idea. But I think we need to sort of um, gather, our, uh, gather our thoughts, gather our potential projects um, and have a proper, possibly a clearer understanding of what the delivery model is. So is it, is it you know, a, a powers community energy? Is it four local groups aren't making the ask but doing that ask jointly? Or is it, is it a big solar co-op type model route, as it were? You know? Yes. I think Duncan, I think you were out of the room, but we, uh, Alison had asked, you know, what the alternatives to the big solar coal, and and uh, part of my answer was to say that you know you could form a Paris Community Energy Group uh, that was working, you know, across across the four towns and uh, uh, potentially elsewhere if you can get people interested in those localities, and that that might go down better with the county council. Um, than saying, oh, we're bringing in this this um, um, outfit that operates across the UK and is based in England. Um, there's still a lot of tribe, tribal <laughs> tribalness about around these things. I mean, that's why we we uh, and uh, I cite the example of Shropshire and Telford Community Energy, which we set up on a similar basis, and we had to call it Shropshire and Telford, otherwise Telford Council would never have talked to us. You know, so. Um, you know, there, there there could be advantages in going down, uh, you know, a Paris community energy route, um, uh, and and it might give you a bit more flexibility. You know, you might you might be able to push the boundaries a bit more. You know, whereas as we said, big solar really looking for rooms over fifty kilowatts, and and um, you know, if you if you go with the big solar, then you know they are working on schemes across the uk so you know the the um you know the power schemes might take a while to get to the top of their agenda that's you know um hopefully it wouldn't but you know that that's got to be that's got to be borne in mind <clears throat> yes alison well presumably the community energy group the benefit society or whatever it is <clears throat> could work with paris county council to finance solar fitting on social housing, which would then reduce the bills for tenants and get that whole programme going much more quickly than the council could afford to do. That would that would be a great thing to do, but how 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 do you get your money back? Is the question. Mm. Do you do you have a uh, because. You're not supplying all the electricity to the to the tenant. Do you send them a separate bill for the electricity they've used directly from the um, from the PV system on their house? That's a lot of billing and administration. Um, do you charge them a you know a standard a standard annual fee to say you know you can have PV on your house? It's going to cost you a hundred pound a year. You know. Um, but you know, to pay back the PV panel installation in any in any uh, reasonable time, um, you, you you'd probably be looking at four hundred pounds a year. You know, it's it's it, it's a difficult one to make work. I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it. But um, I think I think personally, the priorities. You know, let's let's get some factory roofs on. Let's get some care homes. Let's get some office blocks. You know, let's. Uh, and then, and then you've got an organisation that's got a track record, it's got a cash flow, it's got ways of working, and then you can start you can start putting some energy into doing more difficult things. Uh, and one of those more difficult things, this is my my carrot that I keep wanting to dangle in front of people, it is community shared ownership within wind farms as well, because they yes. are going to happen. Uh, mm. uh, and you know, it, it, we need to provide the infrastructure on the ground <clears> to buy into that as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Duncan? Duncan, you're muted. You're muted. Am I? Oh, sorry. No, you're fine now. No, I'm not, no. Uh, on the question of Paris Community Energy, um, if, if there were such things set up, it may then be more feasible to uh, employ somebody, at least one person full time, because there'd be a wider uh, source of funding uh, to push the project forward. 
and you know in having people employed to do these projects i think yeah, works much better than depending on people like us who are volunteers and um can be unreliable <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in my in, in in my experience, volunteers can be more reliable than paid staff. But uh, that's uh, um, yeah. Um, I think I think Eg Egni are trying to do it with basically with with a fully sort of paid staff model, and I think that creates an issue whereby they really have to have the best sites, and only the best sites in order to to get their sort of development money back and pay for their their team of staff um i wish them well i hope it works big solar co-op is uh is has paid staff but is still very much pushing the role of volunteers and is saying that the, the aim of the big solar co-op is to become volunteer led it's not volunteer led at the moment volunteers are important the 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 problem you can have when if you employ somebody is that everybody else says, oh, I don't need to do anything anymore. The, the, the paid person can do it. And it's amazing the amount of effort, you know, 10 volunteers can put in a hell of a lot of effort that one paid employee cannot replicate. So ideally, you would have one paid employee who's who's acting as a multiplier and encouraging volunteers and, in, you know, rather than replacing them. Uh, I think one of the difficulties is is the concentration of focus in terms of delivering a project like this, which is it, it's a Paris disease almost. In as much as we've got that many different hats that we wear, that actually concentrating on on delivering one thing is, is quite difficult for us, you know. And I think that's what we need to probably get over if if we go down a, a route whereby we're volunteer led, as it were. You know? Yeah. Uh, on on that note, actually, Dave. Um, Dave We've talked about generation uh, and we've talked about, you know, uh, potentially amalgamating these areas. So so the original study that, that you've done in, in terms of the CRF funding is is community based on three communities. OK, so that's revealed some um, some opportunities. I suppose the if we go down a, a sort of a, a putting the eggs into a, a single basket in terms of trying to take those forward, I suppose the, the question that at the back of my mind is is what's there left to do for the individual groups that have sort of sort of promoted this study uh, and i suppose i'm getting here in terms of the, the balance between generation and 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 all the other stuff that you could be doing on campaigning for in terms of energy efficiencies in your area i don't know if you've got a view on that or if anybody's got a view on that actually well as i say i think I, I think volunteers will will be crucial for this moving forward, no matter what setup you take on. Um, the advantage of not forming local CBSs is that the volunteers can then concentrate on things like, you know, finding the contacts, talking to people, you know, um, and that sort of thing. You know, I. I'm sure there are other roofs that we've missed, you know, there might be, or, you know, maybe, maybe somebody, you know, plays golf with the, with the plant well, manager at, at, at the factory or, to be, you fair, know, stuff I mean, like to be fair, I mean, there was a comment from Tim, uh, not from Tim, from uh, Will, uh, who owns that farm down in Llanutted about yes. some of his roofs, as it were. So, so yes, yes. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so I think you know that there's going to be lots to do, as well as contributing. You know, if we if if we set up a central Paris, and obviously that will need a board to run it and and to drive that forward. So you know, a representative from each area on that would be would be really good. So so can we ask that question of of um, I, I suppose it's Anthony um, and Alan in terms of Brace and um, and perhaps uh, Kate. From, from from the groups that were were part of this study I mean what are your thoughts um going forward what 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 is this sort of um experience sort of giving you in terms of ideas for for, for the direction of travel locally Anthony hi yeah um yeah first of all uh, yeah thanks for the uh, report Dave it's, it's um very interesting um I guess the consensus here um, when we reviewed it was uh, it was slightly disappointing not in terms of the work done but in terms of 
the, you know, what, what the report showed us. Um, I think it, there had been a real wish that there would be something that we could do um, surrounding um, a hydro scheme, a low head hydro on the uh, Irvine, um, particularly as the one location locally that would present us with a, a potentially good customer for that energy and uh, customer has already expressed well in, uh, an interest in, in, uh, in being part of a scheme like this. Um, uh, it was uh, um, uh, at Dolacoid. Uh, it, it, it would have made, it, it seemed like everything was, would have uh, present, uh, given us quite a, a good um, community energy um, uh, uh, opportunity. There. The problem we've got, as we now understand, the nature of that river is, is just doesn't lend itself to hydro. Um, <clears throat> I think if we, if, if we take the, if, if we look at the potential rooftop solar schemes, then um, working with, um, with big solar co-op on, um, uh, again, on that dolichoid site, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, it wouldn't be particularly, a, a, because we discussed, it wouldn't be a, a, a community um, uh, initiative, um, in, in terms of actually making it happen, it would be a case of effectively making the introductions. But I think it could, one of the things that we, we hadn't discussed on, you know, sort of why companies don't just invest in solar themselves. Sure, there's the, the, the um, uh, return on investment criteria that are used in a lot of um, uh, private companies and the public. Um, of, of needing to show a return over uh, two to three years, and that, that clearly mitigates against um, the likes of solar. Um, however, another thing that, that, that can make partnering with a, 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 um, a, a co-op such as Big Solar uh, attractive is, is um, the uh, environmental, social and governance uh, criteria that, that, that firms have to show. And the environmental PR value to uh, to companies. So taking that electronics firm in Planotis, I haven't discussed this specifically with them, but I imagine looking at the sort of work they do, it might be that for them, the, there's a greater value in um, corporate citizenship to be seen as part of a of a, of a scheme that actually promotes solar around the country actually has a sort of leverage in the amount of carbon saved um, beyond what they save from their own roof. So at, at a, at, within Planotid, that's definitely one to, for us to look at. I'd be quite happy to work with um, Dave and uh, to, to, to affect introductions with some of the other building owners, although to be honest, personally, I don't think there's the sort of paybacks that we would get from, uh, from that Dolacoid site. Um, separate to all of that, the other, so, so, you know, in general terms, I don't think Clonotid would be looking to, at this point to set up a community benefit society of its own. Um, I, 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 although I, I believe that we would be very likely to be uh, uh, interested in a Paris-wide scheme. Um, what there was a consent, a strong consensus here for looking at, her, which is rather separate to what we've been talking about, is to get together and see what we could do about um, uh, providing advice, advice, expertise relating to um, uh, insulation and improving every energy efficiency of existing building stock because we we felt that there's possibly more that can be done in terms of energy savings carbon savings at that level than, than is currently being tapped into at the moment so that that may be much more in about an ad hoc um, uh, initiative than the sorts of things that we've been talking about of community energy schemes but it nonetheless might be very sensible for us to uh, to, to to focus upon. So that's kind of a summary for, for, for from uh, the discussions we've had here. Yeah, the very fact that it gives you a focus uh, or a potential direction is useful. Dave, did you want to come in at all? On, on... Well, it's just for those who weren't at the August workshop, we did 
cover right at the beginning that um, community energy now uh, tends to mean renewable energy. But when community energy started out, it was all about energy efficiency. And we do have Lightfoot, who are based just over the border in Bishop's Castle, who do quite a lot of work in Paris on home, house, home energy surveys, uh, thermal imaging, uh, carbon footprinting, um, you know, and so so certainly if you want to help individual householders, uh, then uh, doing some work on on energy efficiency and advice is is a great way to go. And um, but, you know, the reports, the, the work we were asked to do was to look into, you know, renewables opportunities. So that's what we've concentrated on here. But I was very careful in the initial workshop to say, don't forget about energy efficiency. And um, for your um, information, Anthony, you know, uh, part of the Community Renewal Fund projects that have been happening, we've also been working with a group called Paris um, Action for Community um, Energy. No, it isn't. It's uh, well, I've forgotten the acronyms. Acronyms have gone out of my head. But they've well, done a, a number it's of... PACE, isn't it? Pace, yeah. Pace, yeah. Paris Action for the Climate Emergency. There you go. I've got it in the end. Uh, and they have done a number of reports around um, how to go about home energy auditing and training up local um, uh, people with the skills to actually go and do those audits. There's there's stuff about climate action planning as well. So I, I think when I share, Duncan's already asked me to share the Flanidloys report, I'll share those reports with you as well. So that hopefully that'll give you uh, some ideas about actions that you might take on the energy efficiency side or, or you know, the other planning. Uh, that, to take on. that would be very useful, very welcome, because I know um, that, that, as I say, there's a lot of interest in that locally. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, uh, just while you're on, Nick, um, you mentioned about... Um, maybe setting up uh, uh, an energy local workshop. Yeah. Uh, again, I know that there's a lot of interest here. Um, there are some um, uh, there, are, there are some people with small scale hydro and um, uh, solar who fall within the catchment of the, um, uh, of the substation who um, uh, generate at, at many times much more than they can uh, they can uh, are allowed to export or, or that they can use. And if there was some means of having a more granular um, implementation of energy local than perhaps has been done in the initial schemes like this VESDA, uh, I, 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 looking on the energy local site, it's interesting to see that uh, a lot of those clubs have moved on from, from just having a single source of, of, of hydro to having a sort of almost a, a local portfolio of so small scale solar farms and hydro um, and some wind. Um, if, if it's possible that, that, that the envelope of that energy local um, model could be pushed to an even more granular level, then it might be something that would, um, that would work very well in a community like this. As I remember, uh, this is just an aside, um, where the energy local model came from before it got incorporated into uh, you know, ESCOs and, and, and uh, community energy generation schemes was very much that granular sort of aspect. It came out of that. How do you actually combine local um, solar powers on solar panels on, on houses? You know, how do you how do you make your street and almost an ESCO? You know, that type of stuff. So, yeah. so certainly areas for investigation there, I think, definitely. And I know that. Of the time and, 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 and so I know I'd like to bring in, in Alan, if that's all right as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Alan? Oh yeah, just just summarising the report from our perspective. Um, yeah, thanks very much. It provided great uh, sort of clarity, and I think for us, it opened up or showed that there are actually quite a lot more options than we'd initially thought. I think the the list of sites we've got in feasibility study is is way bigger than the ones we'd initially thought of. I think for us, um, me and you know, the discussion so far today has been really interesting because you know. Three of the biggest sites are really the high school, the sports centre and the library, which are all on the same site, but are all obviously how it's county council is, is the landlord there. So I suppose it's both kind of a bit of a blocker and an opportunity, you know, that they're all dependent, they'd all be dependent on Powys. Um, but obviously that seems, it seems to me anyway, that we've now got a reasonably strong proposition to go to them with, that, you know, we've got these sites that are all connected um have a decent energy use and a decent sort of capacity and obviously the discussion with all the other groups and you know 
schools and, and leisure centres do seem to be some of the best sites in, in all three groups. Um, so we haven't we haven't had a chance to feedback as a group yet, but I guess what I'll be going back and saying is kind of that, you know, this is really strong, or sorry, we've got this really strong site, but actually it might be better if we can work across all three communities to sort of target how it's um, for those. Um, so yeah, I think that sort of, it sort of chimed in quite well with what, what had initially occurred to me anyway. Um, I don't know if Alison's got anything to add to that. It's, I think Jackie's got something to say. To that. <laughs> Jackie, do you want to come in? You might be muted, Jackie. Oh, yeah. Something just popped into my head, totally unrelated to anything that was been talked about. But an, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Yep. Okay, so the um, renewable centre at McContless long ago had some kind of lift which was powered by uh, a weight coming up and then going down again, which released energy, I think. And I'm sure people have talked about that off and on as a way of, of making small amounts of energy. Is this, is this a fiction or is it real? Uh, well, they, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got they've basically got a water powered lift at at, uh, at the Centre for Alternative Technology. So basically, when the people get in at the bottom, they pour water into the tank uh, at the top, and uh, and it pulls the. Um, you've got two cars basically. Sorry, so people if people are in the morning, people are going up. They've put water in the tank and the top car until it's heavier than the bottom car and it just pulls pulls the bottom car up and in the afternoon when people are leaving uh they then pump that water back into the bottom car and it um and it pulls the the top car down um so um yeah so it's a very interesting scheme i'm not sure i mean it does it still consumes energy because you're pumping the water in and out of the cars but it's obviously a lot less than the energy it would have used if it was electrically powered. Um, I'm not sure how relevant that is to uh, other sites. It's a you know it's a particularly good idea on that site, but uh, yeah. Oh, that's okay, so Jim. not not very applicable to our situation, our no, general no. situation. No, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wondered if there's any any feedback from Prestine. I, I, I'm very conscious of the time. I, I, Liz, I don't know if you want to dive in as well in terms of an evaluation point of view uh, or whether we're, we're fitting your needs in terms of the evaluation on it. I have got a poll just to warn you before you all leave. I'm going to subject you to a, a quick poll. Um, but I just wondered if um, in Kate or, or, or the, the, the Remingtons in, in Prestine wanted to come back in terms of... Um, uh, first thoughts in terms of way forward from, from a Prestine perspective? Um, I, I think that the whole process has helped us a lot. Um, Dave sort of walked us through with the, with the workshop and the visit and this. I don't think we've come up with any radical uh, decisions yet at all. Yeah. Hillary just had a question, I know. Um, I think actually I did want to say that Anthony's processing that they've been doing is very similar to what we've been doing. He covered just about all the same areas as we did. But I know Hillary had something to say. Uh, Hillary, do you want to come in quickly? Um, yeah, I was just saying that um, I think that the, the, the sticking point is with Western power at the moment, and therefore that needs to be lobbied on a, you know, a central, uh, more of a political level to get anywhere at all. Yeah. Um, so that we could consider any viable projects. I don't know. You can see the strength in depth yeah. is, is a potential option there, yeah? Yeah. Because I'm guessing, Dave, if if, if Prestine Roos were, were looking to go down, say, the big solar court route, then you would provide perhaps not not a, a, a the influence so much, but at least the foot soldiers to be able to do that, wouldn't you? In terms of... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and the great limitation on the grid is if you've got a scheme that is just exporting to the grid. So if you wanted to put a turbine on a, on a hill or 
you know, a, a hydro scheme up the river and you wanted to feed directly. That's where the great limitation is. It's not to say that, that you still need to ask their permission for doing rooftop and, you know, it might be tricky with some of the larger schemes, but if the building is using a large portion of what you're generating, then the issue is not, not as great because if when you are exporting, it's likely to be used by the buildings around you anyway. It's very unlikely to go out through the substation and, 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 and out into the wider grid. So yes, we do need to check with the DNOs, but that's that's hopefully not, not as great an issue. More but that's why we're not looking at larger community energy schemes that are grid connected. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, um, Liz, do you want to do you want to say anything? Shall I, shall I just sum up? Because I, mean, I, I think it's been fascinating this morning. And then from an evaluation point of view, I mean, I can see that um, what started out as individual communities with ideas, and it, it's really interesting to see, firstly, how um, the individual sort of situations have been unpacked um, in a, a very um, a coherent and organised way with the, the production of the reports and what Dave's actually presented today. But I, I, I can see an, an evolution, you know, of this work Working together, and I think you have identified through the Powers County Councils, the Western Powers, whatever, some uh, some 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 um, targets, if you like, that you need to address collectively. So uh, th that's the sort of that's the sort of thing that I um, that that I will be pulling from, I suppose. This, given that this whole project involves. 30 odd locality projects and I've got to write a short report about this or shortish. So um uh, th those are the sort of, that's the sort of trajectory. And I think that does throw up other questions about what next and 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 what and I need a conversation with um with Nick about you know what Pavo's role is in this, what resources are needed, what um further information shares, etc., what role Pavo will actually take in this, or where or wh who else needs to be involved. So there's a lot of questions there which won't be answered immediately in terms of what I'm doing but they will give a launch pad hope through hopefully through my report for any future funding or whatever hopefully that should come online not in the not too distant future um, for you to actually carry on with this journey and um, collectively and to give you the support to do that so um i just wanted to thank you for that nick mentioned a quick poll which we did put together three very quick questions which will give me the data you know on what i've just said almost um but i've just been taking notes and that i think that's the the overarching sort of journey i think that i'm going to take from today so i don't know if anybody else has got anything else they want to add to that okay well, people might be thinking about that. Uh, you did mention future funding, um, Liz, yeah. uh, and there yeah, is. I, know. This, I don't want to put you in the spot, though, Nick. There is this thing called the social uh, the, sorry, shared sorry, prosperity uh, fund, shared prosperity <laughs> fund um, which comes out of the same stable of the, uh, of the as the CRF, which has funded the particular pieces of work we've been talking about today. So you know, uh, there is there is a target to shoot at in terms of actually being able to potentially fund some of the more the next stages development work. Um, we have set up um, a, uh, a group, uh, a Google group, um, which I'm hoping everybody's on. I know I've, I've gone direct to some people, but I'm hoping that, you know, anybody I've, who's been on this call today won't mind if I add them to the group and, and you know, please object if that's the case. Uh, and once we've done that, that's a means of communicating, basically, and, and taking this conversation forward. And, and, you know, even though I can't tell you what resources Pavo have to actually be able to 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 keep sort of um, uh, this conversation going. I certainly, personally, with my own personal interest in this, will will make every endeavour to, to to try and get this organised a bit and try and actually push us forward to to consider the options going forward. And and one of the takeaways from that will be energy local, uh, and then how to how to approach Paris about some of these options as well. So watch this space on that. I think. Um, Dave, do you want to say anything is as a parting shot or? No, uh, well, apart from thanking everybody for their uh, their interesting contributions and 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 involvement. Uh, yeah, it's been really great to that you've that you're so interested and um, yeah, and interesting. Thank you. Very really good. Anyway, <laughs> unless anybody wants to come in, uh, I think we're coming to a, a, a natural end here. So, uh, you know, the promise from me is that I will try and take forward the two things that I've got written down. 
uh, and hopefully we can get more of a discussion going on on where to go now on how to do this and, and, and I think that involves all of us so so um, I'm just sort of checking faces checking screens it doesn't look like there's anybody going to come in so I'm going to stop recording thank you for people putting comments in the in the 